Life are in listen only mode. Welcome everyone to another session of the Community Orchard Network webcast. Um, my apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, we're slow to get started here, but we are all set. Very excited for today's session. Today's session uh, features two of um, our pioneers here in, um, in community orchards and in, in planting edible trees. And uh, we're going to be featuring uh, both Megan Newsmer, oh, Megan, you can correct me, <laughs> um, and, uh, and Dominic uh, Vitiello. Um, okay, and we are so excited to have them both on um, the session today. First, we'll be having, um, and if you have questions for either Dominic or Megan, um, go ahead and type them in the questions box. We're gonna go ahead and read those after each presentation. So first, we'll, we'll be featuring um, uh, Dominic, who will discuss a variety of gleaning programs aimed at supplying hunger relief organizations in the United States. Um, drawing from the finding of Dominic's national study of food banks' involvement um, in and links to local agriculture. So his presentation um, is gleaning from commodity surplus to food justice. And Dominic joins us now. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you. Um, so um, welcome, everyone. Um, this is uh, some research that I did. I'm a, I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in, in city planning and urban studies. Um, but one of the things that I work on uh, both in, in practice and in research is urban agriculture, mainly focused on community gardens. And um, I uh, was involved with the Philadelphia Orchard Project on its board uh, in its early years um, with, with Phil Forsyth and, and others who, who run it now. Um, and uh, in, in some sense, this research uh, grows out of some of that pract you know, practice work with uh, the Orchard Project, thinking about um, what we might like to do as an organization um, next beyond um, the, the planting of orchards, which is really how uh, POP started um, and uh, is it's now been, been gleaning for about a year, year and a half. Um, it's one of the you know, additional things that we do, um, that POP does. Um, but um, also as an academic, I, I have an interest in uh, the extent to which urban agriculture uh, in particular has been contributing to community food security in the United States and, and also around the world. Um, and so those are in some, some senses the inspirations for this research. Um, I've also done a, a good bit of work with hunger relief organizations, um, which are increasingly uh, tied, uh, you may well know, to urban agriculture and to, to local agriculture uh, generally, uh, and some are, are very deeply involved with their own programs. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those, but mainly focus on gleaning. So I'm going to see if I can advance the slides. Um, there we go. Um, whoops, a little too fast. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly. Um, you know, mentioned what you know, the definition of gleaning. One thing I learned in this research is not that many people know what it means. Um, talk briefly about its origins and, and a little bit about the uh, you know our broader study um, uh, and, and focusing on gleaning for food banks. Um, and and then uh, hopefully spend most of my time um, talking about several examples of gleaning programs uh, and organizations uh, around the United States. And then I'll turn it over to Megan uh, to talk about the the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project. Um, and I think we'll we we will uh, take questions or, or just you know, really answer and discuss questions uh, with all of you um, after her presentation. Okay. Um, so gleaning, right? Uh, you know, as as probably most of you know, uh, or, or probably you know everyone in this audience knows, um, you know, really just means collecting um, the remains of a crop after a farmer or gardener has harvested it, uh, meaning sort of seconds or, or or what you know people don't want to either sell or use uh, themselves, and it, it has very old origins. It's a, a very ancient practice and was codified in the agricultural poor laws of the Bible. I won't read you these quotes, but in Leviticus and De Deuteronomy, right? Um, um, the you know, gleaning was really again codified as something that um, you know, farmers had to allow the poor to do 
um, as, as a way uh, to share their harvest um, with strangers, and the fatherless, the widow, etc. Right? You can read the quotes. Um, our study, uh, again, looked at, at more than gleaning. Um, you know, uh, as, as I mentioned, I, I've worked a, a bit in urban agriculture and with food relief organizations um, and noticed that uh, food banks in particular and other food you know, relief organizations were, uh, or emergency food you know, organizations were uh, becoming increasingly linked and involved in local agriculture um, in their cities, towns, and regions. Um, and if you read the news about this, um, you know, from coast to coast, if you if you hear, you know, if you if you, if you listen to uh, you know the radio or, or watch TV or, or read the newspaper, um, you know, there you, you've seen you know stories about um, food banks in particular. Um, you know, really changing the ways they work by getting involved in local agriculture, either having their own farm or garden or, or connecting with farms and gardens in their, in, in, in their locality. Um, and, you know, this you know, to me made me really wonder, okay, what's really changing in food banks? Because food banks have um, you know, long been criticized by people in the community food security movement, by academics, uh, by folks mainly on the left. Um, Classically, Janet Poppendike, um, who's a professor at, at, at Hunter College, um, you know, uh, been criticized for for distributing what people consider bad food: um, canned, boxed, processed foods, uh, high in sodium, high in fats, uh, um, not uh, healthful produce, right? Not fruits and vegetables, but you know, uh, the the claim. You know, is by, by many that um, you know, as food banks are, and they really are, uh, getting uh, many more fruits and vegetables into their uh, distribution streams. They're really changing uh, both what they do and really their roles in uh, community and regional food systems. Um, you know, as part of this critique of food banks, you know, people charge that that you know, really, the commodity surplus system that is our, our sort of main food relief system through food banks um, uh, really benefits industry uh, more than it benefits poor people. It, it, it also massages the egos of middle class volunteers, is the charge, right? Um, and you know, convinces them that they're solving problems of poverty and hunger. Um, you know, so again, our, our question was really, you know, to what extent is local agriculture really, you know, helping to change food relief? Um, and we, we set out to, to you know, g gather some rather basic information on the scale and scope of um, particularly food banks ties to and involvement in uh, local agriculture, uh, documenting the types of programs that they run uh, or are connected to in formal ways, um, and, and the volume of fruits and vegetables uh, that they distribute, um, and, and uh, by extension the proportion of fruits and vegetables that they distribute as, as you know, a, a proportion of the total food that they, uh, that they give away. Um, or Really, they mostly sell to uh, to food cupboards and soup kitchens at at, at low rates. Um, we did a national survey. I, I won't bore you with the details. Uh, it was funded largely by um, my own university's Center for Public Health Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, the food relief organization with which I have worked the most um, was really our, our research partner in this, called the Share Food Program in Philadelphia. And there are shares in, in a number of other regions around North America. You may know them. Um, and so we, we did a national survey and then visited uh, 12 um, food banks or allied organizations um, for interviews and, and uh, um, also you know, participating in some of their work. Um, and uh, very briefly, you know, it's important to note that uh, we weren't just studying gleaning. Um, you know, I, I think this slide shows um, in, in to, for the most part, in, in, in order of uh, the order of prevalence, right, of, uh, uh, of these sorts of programs, right, if food banks uh, are involved in or connected to uh, grow a row programs, uh, you know, donations from farmers and gardeners. Um, some food banks have started their own garden support programs, uh, community gardens, school and home gardens. Um, uh, food banks, many food banks uh, now have their own farms uh, and even more have their own gardens uh, and some contract with farms uh, on a CSA or single crop basis um, and um, while this isn't really about sourcing, um, some also have kitchens, really substantial kitchens um, in which they process and preserve and some, uh, in some of that produce and, and also uh, a few uh, run 
food sector worker training um, that, that takes advantage of their kitchens as well as the food that they procure. Um, but I'm going to focus on gleaning and, and certainly the vast majority of the produce that dis is distributed by food banks and, and allied programs um, it comes from gleaning. Um, uh, this is just a really real summary uh, uh, table. I'll, I, I won't you know, read the details of it uh, for you, but um, it lists the food banks um, that in 2011, which is the year that we, uh, for which we collected, um, you know, data. So if you see, you know, something missing, either we missed it or it wasn't active in 2011, uh, or didn't achieve uh, this sort of threshold for this table. Um, uh, these, these are the food banks um, that uh, distribute more than 5% of their total food distribution as, as produce, right? Produce as, as more than 5%. And some, you can see, um, both large and small uh, food banks um, have achieved a, a significant amount, right, of produce, right? 50% um, or, or, or close to it. Um, but uh, I should stress that these, uh, I think, 17 food banks on this uh, list are a, a very small sample of the, the, the many in, in the United States. Um, and uh, the column on the right also shows you that there's a, a great you know, variability in the amount of uh, produce that they uh, distribute per person uh, to whom they, they distribute. Um, okay, a couple of other tables um, on the upper left uh, shows you <coughs> Um, some of the smaller, mostly smaller organizations um, donating produce to food banks uh, and at the bottom right, um, some much bigger programs that uh, are, are almost, yeah, that, that are not almost, uh, that are absolutely all um, uh, doing 100% gleaning. That's really where the scale in gleaning is um, for, for food relief is um, in these sorts of programs at, at the bottom right. Um, and I'll come back to um, you know, some of the, what I think are the important distinctions between uh, the sorts of programs at the upper left. I'll talk a little bit about the Portland Fruit Tree Project, which I think a lot of you know, a little bit about Village Harvest, um, and also a little bit about some of uh, those at the bottom right. Um, just briefly, um, and you can see uh, you know, a no preview of some of the New Orleans fruit tree project work at the right, um, uh, the pictures at the right. But um, some you know, the the sites uh, that 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 um, these programs were, you know, people involved in these programs gleaned include neighborhoods, both private and public spaces, um, community gardens and urban farms, uh, commercial fields, orchards, and packing houses. Right. So we're not just talking about gleaning orchards um, by any means. That's an important thing to, to keep in mind. But uh, a significant amount of, of gleaning orchards um, you know, uh, occurs for, for food banks. Um, and then the outlets for produce gleaned by and for food banks and, and their partners um, include you know, redistributing it quickly, right, uh, just in, in, in bags and boxes um, to, to end users, right, or to food cupboards, pantries, uh, food kitchens that, that use it or pass it on to their constituents. Um, and um, for fruits and vegetables, especially more perishable ones, um, it's the, the supply chain issues are, are, are really quite significant in this work. And um, some of these programs are, are incredibly sophisticated in running um, very tight and quick supply chains, um, as one needs to, you know, to, to, to do if you're a um, big produce industry, right? Um, some, uh, a much smaller number of uh, programs, process and preserve uh, the, the fruit uh, and other foods that they, that they um, clean. Uh, I think it's uh, the St. Mary's Food Bank in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, has a partner with uh, an industrial juice company that um, turns a lot of what it uh, gleans uh, into juice that it then distributes. Um, some, uh, again, a very small, relatively small number, uh, prepare and share meals with constituents. Um, some run cooking and canning classes, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, some food banks uh, run food worker training programs in kitchens like the one you see at the right. Um, in just a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll go through some uh, some of the examples uh, of, of gleaning programs. But um, just to sum up our real sort of three key uh, findings uh, related to our, our research question, right? Uh, you know, is this activity um, really changing the work of food relief organizations? You know, mainly food banks. Um, you know, um, I think yes and no, and in different ways is our answer, right? Uh, so we find really three key trends. The the, the first and largest um, trend is that um, 
engaging in local agriculture or linking to local agriculture and getting produce from it, right, really extends the commodity surplus system beyond cans and boxes and, and gets in some places a, a tremendous amount of fruits and vegetables to poor people. Um, and that in itself, I think, is a really positive uh, change for food banks and the, particularly the food that they distribute, the mix of food. Um, and yet I don't think it really changes their relationship either to industry or necessarily their relationship uh, very much to uh, to poor people or to you know, uh, other institutions in society. Um, Certainly, um, this, these activities expand opportunities for and, and also reliance upon middle class volunteers uh, you know, um, who, who do a lot for uh, the food relief system in our country. Um, and, and yet some programs, um, and um, you know, I, I think in some ways they're outliers, but there are a growing number of programs and some of them exist within food banks and more exist, I would say, um, as partner organizations, uh, are genuinely changing uh, food banks' relationships to poor people, right? Investing in poor people's capacity to grow and prepare their own food. Um, and this mostly me, you know, uh, uh, occurs within the context of community and, and home and school garden support programs, um, more so than gleaning programs, though I think there are you know, one or two, uh, um, or maybe more uh, um, rather exceptional gleaning programs that are really you know, legitimately investing in poor people's capacity to, to meet some of their own food needs, right? Um, in, in some ways, I, I, you know, the, I, I just gave you a synonym for community food security, right? Um, Okay, so uh, let me just run, you know, try, to, try to run quickly through a, a series of programs. The biggest one in the United States, the biggest gleaning program, um, and the biggest local agriculture program tied to food banks is the Farm to Family program run by the California Association of Food Banks, right, the consortium of food banks. Um, farm workers pick what they would leave, packing house workers pack what they would toss, and truck transport to food banks which redistribute to, 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 to cupboards and, and in the many ways that the food banks distribute. Um, almost a, you know, close to 127 million pounds uh, of produce in 2011 you know, went through this program. Um, A somewhat you know different uh, and, and somewhat older program that you may know is the Society of St. Andrews, which works in almost every state across the the, the continental U.S., uh, but is especially concentrated in the southeastern U.S. Um, their model uh, of organization is, is in some ways rather different. Um, they marshal volunteers, uh, mainly from church groups, uh, to glean farmers' fields, uh, especially potatoes. I don't know that they glean orchards, but they may well. Um, and they uh, distributed uh, about 27 million pounds uh, of, of fresh produce in 2011. Most of it pretty shelf stable. Um, potatoes, as I said, you, you see a few different crops here, but um, you know the onions at the uh, or no the oranges at the upper right and, and and potatoes are things that are you know pretty pretty shelf stable. Um, Arkansas is another state we found. Um, I, don't remember the number, but a good number of states, at least a dozen, um, with statewide gleaning programs um, tied to their state associations of, of uh, food banks, right? Um, gleaned over one million pounds uh, in, in a produce in, in 2011 in Arkansas. Um, but you may notice, right, um, that everyone in this picture is wearing the same uniform, and then there's this guy on the horse on the right, right? Um, almost all of the labor in the Arkansas Cleaning Project, and some in some other statewide cleaning programs, is done by uh, prisoners, um, which is yet a different model, right? Uh, and, and depending on your views, may or may not um, be promoting um, you know, some element of, of food justice and, and, and community food security. Um, at the complete other end of the spectrum, um, this is really not within our study so much, but um, you know, it comes out of, of, of some work we were doing in Philadelphia uh, years ago, and this is an old map, but um, at the complete you know, other end of the spectrum, we have sort of individuals out there foraging. I'm not even, you know, certainly cleaning, but not, not in you know, especially organized ways, right? Um, so several years ago, maybe five or six years ago, um, a friend of the Orchard Projects in Philadelphia uh, put out this foraging map that included some of the pop orchards as well as other places that um, they knew of 
trees that people could could access, right? Available for trees to glean, um, but a, an increasing number of programs um, around the U.S. Um, smaller community-based programs are gleaning from communities, right? From neighborhoods. Um, Village Harvest is uh, probably the largest of these in terms of its not in terms of its staff, but in terms of the amount of food that it gleans. Until uh, 2011, it was a volunteer-run organization founded by um, the fellow in the um, on the ladder at the right, uh, Craig De Sarens in, in San Jose, who's a, a former uh, computer programmer, right, and, and figured out you know how to develop and manage a, a sort of database of tree owners and and uh, likewise a database of volunteers um, and. Um, to sort of you know uh, plan different routes that would all end at the food bank. Um, San Jose, if you know it, is is a, a, a city and, and set of suburbs built mostly on old orchards, um, mainly of citrus. Again, something relatively shelf stable. Um, Food Forward in Los Angeles um, is is a pretty different model, and in, in some ways more corporate. When we visited them visited them in two, 2012, they had uh, about sort of two and a half staff. Um, by today, they have um, something close to 11. Um, they likewise organize volunteers to glean, uh, mostly from farms. Um, but they also run uh, corporate retreats and school trips and other events for a fee. Uh, food goes to food banks and and and, and uh, cupboards. But um, um, in in many ways, it's it's a it's a sort of certainly more staff intensive, but also sort of more corporate local gleaning. Um, Organization. Uh, they distributed about 350,000 pounds in 2011. Um, and finally, the Portland Fruit Tree Project, which again many of you I, I, I hope know, um, organizes gleaning parties. And I think really significantly, half of these are with volunteers from anywhere, but half of these are sort of closed and and uh, run with, uh, or at least were in 2012 and 11. Um, Half with uh, the clients or, or people who receive food from food pantries and other feeding programs, right? Um, really involving people who experience poverty, hunger, food insecurity, whatever words you want to use, um, in the activities of gleaning, and not only, but also in in food preservation workshops. Um, and um, you know, as as you may know, the Portland Fruit Tree Project plays multiple roles, sort of in its community food system, right? Planting and managing community orchards, uh, running fruit tree tending, um, as well as food preservation workshops. Um, and you know, its its numbers of pounds uh, harvested, right, or distributed in 2011. A little more than, than 70,000 um, look very different, right, from some of the bigger organizations that I mentioned earlier. Right, um, in 2012, it had one full-time staffer and, and, and one uh, vista. It's since expanded, but but still, that's that's pretty much uh, the the number of people who who coordinate the harvest program. Um, I, I think what I've just shown you um, is uh, a wide variety of programs, both in how they operate and really in, in their roles in community food systems. Um, certainly the Portland Fruit, Fruit Tree Project um, is engaging communities in everyday food practices, tying, gleaning to growing, processing, eating, and, and uh, engaging poor people, right, people who experience hunger in ways that um, Pretty much none of the other programs uh, that I lived, that I you know, ran through uh, are doing in especially meaningful ways, right? Um, getting back to our, our our larger findings, so I just wanted to end by leaving uh, you know posing a set of questions to you, right, folks in the community orchards gleaning network, right? Um, about what does it really mean to have a community orchard and fruit tree gleaning program or system? Because I don't really believe you need to have a program necessarily, right? Um, if you can have people doing the work, um, institutionalized or not, um, you know. And and also, how do we answer questions, right? About how do you answer questions about the size of your harvest right, and the number of people you reach? Which, for food banks and food relief and many funders of this sort of work, right, uh, is is a fundamentally important, right? Um, and and puts a lot. Sessions that that play different roles and different uh, and finally, right, you know, related to the question: What role do the community play? Food tickets that you know, answers to the uh, 
introduced. So thank you. I will turn it over to Megan. Um, actually, my picture at the right is, is of my son at Holly Grove Market and Farm, which is where the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project was born. I think the last thing I'll say is that I just I think the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project, uh, in addition to being a wonderful program, it was in our uh, our, our our study um, you know, has absolutely the uh, the, the coolest uh, logo that I know. So um, I will turn it over to Megan now. Uh, well, before we get to Megan's presentation, I just want to thank you, Dominic, for such a, a wonderful uh, presentation and um, uh, shedding some light on some really unique models for um, for how we address gleaning um, in communities and, and how we incorporate um, making sure that those 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 foods go to uh, food banks and in you know, programs where they're they're institutionalized. I'm sure that. Many of you have questions for Dominic. If you have questions for him, please go ahead and type them in the questions uh, box on your GoToWebinar control panel. And um, we have a couple couple questions um, in just to get us started. We'll just take a couple minutes for questions, and then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, continue on with Megan's uh, presentation. And as you can see, we're, we're back up at, at Dominic's questions for us slide. <laughs> uh, Dominic's questions for, for those who are practitioners of, um, of, of gleaning in your communities. If you have answers for Dominic's questions, go ahead and type that in the chat box. We'd love to have a vibrant, open discussion about, about what it does mean to have a uh, great community orchard and, and fruit tree or fruit uh, gleaning programs and and how we can encourage more people to get out there and, and help harvest food. So, Donna, we're just going to get started real quick to, um, on some questions uh, for you. Um, we had a question coming in. Do you find groups keep reinventing the wheel when it comes to organization gleaning programs? Or is there a way that groups can share best practices to get programs in place quickly? Hmm. Well, um, I, I think there's probably some reinventing the wheel, um, and and yet, um, you know, we certainly see some important networks out there uh, in which folks have learned from from other programs. Um, I'll perhaps steal something Megan was going to say, and, and and you know, just mention that the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project was inspired uh, in large part by the uh, Portland Fruit Tree Project, right? Um, at the Philadelphia Orchard Project, you know, certainly when I was involved in it, and certainly through this network, right? Um, you know, um, we spent a lot of time talking with other folks who were starting programs, had. Um, you know, programs running, and and even folks who had run programs that had um, you know since closed. Um, I think the um, closure of the uh, Community Food Security Coalition um, was certainly um, uh, a blow to uh, some of those networks. Um, and yet the Growing Food and Justice uh, you know, initiative, um, as well as uh, something that's more involving food banks that actually we helped. Um, um, Sort of the, the one of the food banks that we found, one of the most impressive ones in my view, uh, the the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona in Tucson, um, really started uh, what has just become in the last couple of years uh, a national network of of food banks called the Closing the Hunger Gap. Uh, um, uh, coalition, and they have an annual conference now. They, um, you know, I think um, you know, one of the really interesting things to us was that, um, you know, they told us that, you know, when they went to, the, you know, sort of food justice and, and community food security conferences and, and you know, the meetings, um, people would hear that, you know, people from urban agriculture and food justice organizations would hear that they're from food banks and sort of raise their eyebrows and say, oh, it sounds like you're doing interesting work, but you're a food bank. I'm not sure I want to, you know, hang out with you. Um, by the way, the, the the food bank in Tucson does, you know, runs a community food center. Really does, you know, very community-based, community organizing. Runs absolutely, what it absolutely, you know, um, casts and and I think realizes as food justice programs, some community farms, youth programs, and 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 much more. Um, I think they are a legitimate food justice organization, but. As a food bank, um, other folks are suspicious of them. And when they went to talk about their um, community farming and home garden support programs and other small-scale stuff with other food banks, the other food bank. You know, directors would say, "What? How many pounds did you distribute?" And the answer was not millions and millions. And so, in the world of food banks, where scale matters, and that's how food banks are reimbursed by the state, um, it was a hard sort of 
place to, to you know get any traction on that. Um, and so they started uh, really what's become an alliance again, closing the hunger gap of um, of food banks that are doing this sort of work. Great, great, wonderful. Yeah, you know, it, it really from all the sounds of all the different kinds of programs um, that you highlighted in your presentation, you know, there there are many many ways, right, to um, to to get the same result, which is you know community investment um, and long term um, sustainable gleaning programs and gleaning efforts, um, which you mentioned, of course, can be institutionalized or, or don't have to be institutionalized. And speaking of those kinds of different kinds of programs, we have another question coming in um, around, um, you mentioned the, um, the topic of uh, prison workers going ahead and, and gleaning um, and participating in gleaning programs. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, if there are successful programs, if, if I mean, we all know that there are, there are prisons across the country um, that could potentially um, replicate that model. Um, have you seen any particular model that sticks out to you that's been real successful? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I think the ones that run um, garden training and, and, and uh, what are really in, in, in terms of their out, outputs, uh, landscaping, uh, job training programs, um, and, and, and also food sector worker uh, training programs um, with people who are incarcerated, um, you know, are, are doing something that um, is, is quite important for those people as well as potentially for the food system in that um, they're training people with, you know, transferable skills uh, that, that then people, you know, once they are released um, can, uh, can, can use to go get jobs and, and to, to have, you know, real livelihoods in um, you know, in, in our communities. Um, I think the, the ones that just use uh, prisoners as labor and don't necessarily teach them skills, right, um, are ones that are, are probably uh, more so taking advantage of prison, cheap prison labor um, and uh, not doing as much for uh, people who are incarcerated um, and the communities from which they come. That's more a value statement than a best practice statement. But, <laughs> No, I, I really think that um, you know the the um, you know the, the the some of those big gleaning programs aren't doing much more um, than um, than using prisoners as as cheap labor. Wow, insightful comments. <laughs> uh, well, we we so appreciate your um, your openness and. Um, and, and all the work that you've done with, with the study and um, just sharing your findings with us. Um, and we look forward to touching base with you at the end of the session. And for now, we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward with our second presenter, um, Megan. Yay! So Megan. <laughs> Welcome, Megan. So Megan is, um, Megan, how do you say your last name? <laughs> Uh, it's Neismer. Neismer. Thank you, Megan. You're Megan welcome. Neismer is um, uh, with the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project. Um, the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project began as a simple response to um, one single resident's inquiry for help harvesting um, her satsuma tree. Since that inaugural harvest, um, the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project has offered its services to over 150 households in the greater New Orleans area and provided thousands of pounds of fruit to organizations feeding the hungry each year. Um, the project has evolved over the years from a simple informal response to a small nonprofit and, and finally this fall will become a program of second harvest food bank of greater New Orleans and act Acadiana. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, this presentation will discuss the benefits and challenges of each stage and how each transition was accomplished. And so um, Megan Neismer um, has her master's in public health from Tulane University uh, School of Public Health. Um, she actually is the founder of New Orleans Tree, Fruit Tree Project and is um, you know, responsible for securing relationships with food donors and um, and making sure that the food donations 
um, get processed, you know, from manufacturers, distributors, farmers, brokers, and other food-related organizations within Second Harvest 23 Parish Service Area. And Megan joins us now. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me today. And Dominic, great job. That was a great intro to, um, to discussing the fruit tree project. Um, so um, let's see here. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, the evolution of the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project over the past five years. It has been quite the whirlwind. Um, I have been there <laughs> along with the whole way. Um, just to give you a little background, um, because I had no idea when I moved to New Orleans um, the kind of uh, growing environment that was here. Oh, Sarah, I'm not seeing my arrows. You go ahead. And... Oh, there they are. Thank you. Um, I'm originally from Michigan, and I moved down to New Orleans uh, to go to Tulane seven years ago. Um, and I had no idea what grew here. And so just to give you a little background, um, there is a lot. There are many varieties of citrus that grow here. Satsumas, which are um, pretty much uh, what a, uh, what are those called? Uh, clementines. Uh, they're the same, pretty much the same thing. Uh, grapefruit, Louisiana sweets, lemon, limes, uh, kumquat are the cute little uh, fruits you see there in the upper right hand corner. They're actually pretty great. They're like a, a little sour and sweet candy. You can eat the whole thing, rind and all. Um, we have a, a short fig season here, pears and persimmons. Um, we don't see a lot of persimmons. They're, um, they actually were planted pretty um, frequently, um, you know, decades ago. So not a lot of them are still around, but um, when you do find them, they're, they're beautiful and prolific. Um, so New Orleans does have a rich history of backyard gardening and home orchards. Um, and you can definitely see that in some of the older neighborhoods. Um, you know, you have grapefruit trees and satsuma trees that are, are decades old. Um, unfortunately, with Katrina, um, the city actually um, lost a, a high percentage of its urban canopy, and that included a lot of the fruit trees. Um, and so in a lot of the areas that were, that were hit heavily with, with floodwaters or with, um, with high wind, um, that you just you just don't see the trees like you used to. You hear the stories of, of the trees, but you don't you don't see them anymore. Um, one of the things that we've come across quite a bit, just due to the weather down here, and it is 107 degree heat index today. Um, a lot of people attempt to grow tropical plants here. So you get a lot of people that are trying to plant papayas and mangoes and avocados, and um, you know. We do get a pretty cold winter, so a lot of those don't make it. But it, sometimes it's fun to try. I uh, was trying to grow papayas for a while, but they just they just didn't make it. So that's just a little background um, on New Orleans and, and our growing environment. Oops. Oh, geez. All right, and so just to give you a little idea of the, I'm sorry about that, I'm technically challenged. <laughs> um, just to give you a little uh, background on the New Orleans Fruit Tree Project, um, we have been in existence for five years now. Um, we've harvested almost 40,000 pounds of uh, fruit over the past five years, 150, 160 harvests. Um, we have a huge network of volunteers. Um, we've actually done a bit of fruit tree planting, which I will touch on in a later slide. And over the years, we've secured um, a little over $25,000 worth of funding. Um, so the Fruit Tree Project, New Orleans Fruit Tree Project, started in 2011 um, while I was in AmeriCorps Vista at Holly Grove Market and Farm. Um, Holly Grove Market and Farm is actually a, a small uh, market. It's located in one of the lower income neighborhoods in the city. Um, it sources solely uh, local produce and products. And so um, I was working there just helping with the operations of the market, um, doing community outreach. Um, one of the things that um, we were kind of constantly bombarded with was homeowners would call and they would have access, they would have access fruit. Um, a lot of times, you know, they're elderly, um, there are people that just didn't have the equipment, um, they just weren't familiar with what to do with their trees, maybe they had just bought the house. And so the more we got these calls, the more you know, it was like, well, well, why not? And so um, I ended up borrowing a ladder and taking our market van, and um, we went and harvested a few trees. And in that first year, 
um, we harvested about 3,000 pounds of fruit. I mean, it was very informal. Um, you know, we kind of we did the harvest as people called in. Um, I mostly recruited my friends <laughs> to help, um, and so that was how it started. But it was it was a very organic start, and um, that first year, you know, we just kind of got our, our toes wet with what we were doing. Um, and I wanted to, to kind of say again what Dominic had said um, that. Prior to being in AmeriCorps Vista at Holly Grove Market, I uh, worked in Portland for about six months. And while I never volunteered with the Portland Fruit Tree Project, I did see them in action uh, from my front porch. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. And I kind of filed it away. So um, I think when I was actually at Holly Grove and, you know, kind of faced with this, with this, uh, with this challenge, I, I kind of had the, the foundation for, for what something like that would look like. Um, and during this first phase, too, as we started to get the fruit, um, was when we started to dabble into um, where to bring the fruit. And for someone who isn't familiar with, um, you know, outlets or, or for, for food donations, um, you know, we just started calling people, and it started with uh, reaching out to the New Orleans Mission. And they were the ones that said, you know, you should really just call Second Harvest Food Bank. They serve as, you know, a distribution point for you know, pretty much any organization in the city that is receiving food. And so, you know, in terms of logistics, it, it was really helpful for us that we knew we could just load all the fruit we had harvested in the van and take it to Second Harvest, and it would be distributed from there. And instead of, you know, going and, and trying to form um, individual relationships with organizations, which is in, important, um, but logistically for us, uh, the partnership with Second Harvest um, really made sense. So um, after that first year um, with Holly Grove Market and Farm um, and my Vista year ended, um, I had actually applied for a grant through the city of New Orleans called the Wisner Donation, um, and we were uh, awarded $10,000 um, through, this, through this grant, which was great news. Um, and it, it, it presented a challenge, though, um, because I was no longer technically affiliated with Holly Grove Market and Farm. But our funding had been, uh, since they were the fiscal sponsor, um, the funding had to basically um, come from Holly Grove to me. I, I almost became a contractor at that point. Um, and so the, the grant money, which initially was uh, for purchasing our own vehicle, um, actually was used for a stipend for myself as I continued to do the, the harvest coordinating and um, started to ramp up our outreach. Um, and I actually was still able to use the van from Holly Grove Market, but that was not um, really the ideal situation as um, they were actually not interested in keeping us on as a program, um, which was understandable, you know, different missions um, and, they, you know, they were a market. It, it, was, it was slightly different. Um, so during this stage, we um, began to recruit our, our own volunteers and homeowners. Um, we developed a website, we developed forms where um, homeowners could sign up. Um, we did Sign Up Genius to reach out to volunteers and tell them when, um, when we were going to be having harvest. Um, so it was, it was at the end of our second year um, where grant money was running out and um, it wasn't really sure what was going to, you know, what our future held for us, um, that the Tulane University Center for Public Service um, actually came forward, and that was who uh, was my host when I was in AmeriCorps Vista, uh, and they were in love with the project, and so I think they really wanted to see it, see it succeed, um, and so they kind of took um, a non-traditional route and awarded us three one-year AmeriCorps Vistas um, to keep the project going, even though we weren't technically a nonprofit and we were just kind of functioning as this um, you know, a program, um, they really wanted to see it succeed. And so because of that, um, we were able to pretty much have a full-time employee running the program. Um, and we actually just finished our second year of, of that three-year term, um, which was just amazing. And then as far as the van went, we actually did a Kickstarter <laughs> to raise the money for our, a very adorable Ford Windstar that um, is unfortunately on her last legs, but she, she's done us good. Um, so this was a really fun phase for the Fruit Tree Project. There was a, a lot of learning um, for myself um, and for, um, you know, became a supervisor. Um, we did volunteer recruitment. Um, it, it, you know, was really a fun time. Um, but that being said, I'm sorry. 
tree. Um, it did not come without challenges. So, you know, during this phase, um, um, I was doing it full time as a volunteer, um, but I was doing all the grant writing for the project. Um, the leadership we had, myself, um, and also a board of directors that um, that came together initially, um, because it seemed like the natural progression. Um, we were we had the volunteers, we had the homeowners, we had the car, um, we had an AmeriCorps. Um, it was it, it was as if you know 501c3 status was was our next step, um, which long came a board of directors. Um, unfortunately, at the end of all of it, we we did not go that route. Um, it was an expensive process. And as far as what we were trying to accomplish, it really, it just didn't fit. Um, and I'm sure there's fruit tree projects across the country that have, um, you know, would say otherwise. They would, you know, maybe lean towards what we did. But um, we ended up becoming um, a, a fiscal agent of, of the New Orleans Food and Farm Network um, for the last couple of years. And, and that has fit our needs um, quite well. Um, one of the other challenges, and I actually saw this from a previous webinar, uh, was uh, expectations of our capacity. And I had to include this picture in the middle because this is a 40-foot tall grapefruit tree. And that is my friend, um, Emily, who is standing on someone's playset with a 12-foot pole trying to get the 50 grapefruit that were left on this tree. So <laughs> people had a lot. They thought we were like miracle workers uh, or had bucket lifts or something. but. Um, you know, we just used the tools that we had and we got those 50 down. Um, another, uh, you know, benefit of being a standalone organization, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, is, you know, the autonomy of just running our own project um, and also doing some experimenting as far as working with um, some local farmers markets. Um, we actually, for a brief period, with our homeowners' consent, um, were selling lemons to restaurants um, to cover our transportation costs, um, which, which worked for a while. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we just, we, like all things, we just were experimenting. Um, see here, my buttons. Um, and one of the, one of the most fun uh, projects that we did during this kind of experimental phase was called Planting for the Future. And this was something that we, um, over the years we were harvesting, we noticed that there were certain neighborhoods, and like I mentioned at the beginning, um, they were often low income. They were hit particularly hard by Katrina and other storms um, where we were just not accomplishing any harvest. And so, you know, we assumed maybe our, our, the word wasn't getting out, um, different forms of communication, you know, that we were using versus what maybe people in these neighborhoods used, um, a technology gap, if you will. Um, maybe people had fruit trees, but they were sharing it with their friends and family and they didn't have extra, which would have been great. And then lastly, you know, we could assume that there just weren't any trees. So we actually leaned at the, the ladder and um, partnered with the New Orleans Area Habitat for Humanity. And um, the, NOAA actually sent out letters on our behalf asking their homeowners um, if they were interested in receiving a fruit, fruit tree um, from the fruit tree project. And in our first year, we had 50 fruit tree owners, or I'm sorry, 50 homeowners uh, respond and take us up on the offer. So we actually uh, had a lot of fun. Um, we pretty much visited, um, you can see the neighborhoods in the dark purple there. Um, those, uh, those neighborhoods are pretty much where uh, poverty is most dense. And um, we, we planned 50 fruit trees within those neighborhoods. So uh, it was a lot of fun um, and it kind of got us away from the harvesting, which, which was okay. Um, so, you know, our goal was to add to the urban canopy, um, increase access to fresh fruits, low-income households, um, and to ensure that we continue to grow. You know, at a point, um, if we really do our job, we're going to run out of <laughs> new trees to harvest, but um, so if we keep adding to that, we'll, we'll never be bored. All right, so um, at this point um, in, in our evolution, um, we are like four years in. Um, we've been faced with funding challenges, um, oversight challenges. Um, I actually uh, was no longer running it, um, you know, having a spare time or a part-time job. I was working full-time and trying to um, provide leadership for our VISTA and for our operations. And it really was becoming um, challenging, and, and I will use the word burnout, unfortunately. Um, but at this point, um, it was successful. It's recognized. Um, you know, we were still growing. 
um, but our capacity was running out. And so uh, because I had, luckily, um, I'm working at Second Harvest Food Bank in Greater New Orleans, um, it seemed like a great fit to present to our leadership here um, about taking on the program um, at, at Second Harvest. And um, the great thing was that they agreed. And so beginning this fall, um, the New Orleans Future Project will become a program of Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, it's actually going to be nestled into volunteer services department. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Um, maybe in a year or so we'll report back and, and talk about you know, working as part of a food bank. Um, Second Harvest offers a lot of opportunities, serves 23 uh, parishes, um, it serves, you know, 200,000 people each year. Um, there's actually two satellite uh, warehouses here, um, and their citrus will grows throughout the, well, not throughout the region, but in the New Orleans area, in the Lafayette area, and actually south of New Orleans. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to grow here, um, and there's a lot of opportunity um, to kind of pass over some of the challenging aspects of the program, you know, as far as funding, um, volunteer coordination, and <laughs> that last one there, the vehicle being maintained by transportation, that was never my favorite thing to do. Um, but um, we're really excited about the opportunity, um, and, and we'll see how it goes. So um, I look forward to reporting back about, <laughs> about working the second artist. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your successes and, um, you know, how you guys are implementing your, um, your mission and, um, and sharing some of the administrative pieces, right. That are really important and, and critical to be able to be handled. Um, and if we want to make sure that the, the mission gets accomplished. So, if you have questions for Megan, go ahead and put them in the type them in the questions box in your GoToWebinar um, control panel, and uh, we just have a, a a couple minutes left here. So the first uh, question um, is, uh, Megan, do you still um, do you offer? Um, so you, you mentioned that you you are now adding right to the edible uh, urban forest within um, the New Orleans area. Are you also training, um, offering training like early pruning and, and watering and care to the new owners of those trees? Um, we did put together uh, a new tree owner pamphlet. Um, we also had our homeowners um, sign an agree an, a loving agreement, you know, that they would water and care for the tree and that if they did see any problems um, that they would contact us immediately. And I... I'm so sad to report this, but I'm in good company. Um, we did have one tree owner call and ask for their tree to be dug up because it was getting in the way of their kids' playground. <laughs> so, um, you know, people, you know, I think a lot of people were, were, you know, they asked for the tree, they wanted them, and so we have faith that they're taking care of them, and that they'll call us if they need us. Excellent, excellent. Um, and then also... Um, you talked about some of the administrative challenges um, that you've run into. Um, when, if there are other, if there are other um, kind of small operations going on out there, what would you advise as kind of their first steps um, branching out? And um, you know, maybe they have a small core con con constituent of um, folks who are helping them um, harvest. Um, what would you what what is what are some words of wisdom that you would pass on to to them? Um, what I found was that my even though we were small, our network of who we were working with was quite um, powerful. We you know Tulane University um, was looking out for us. Um, the Food and Farm Network you know was very willing to allow us to use their um, 501c3 status for. Um, you know, grant writing purposes. Um, we had, um, you know, New Orleans Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we worked with them on a couple projects. You know, we, we had strong partnerships, which I think kind of made up for um, our, our size and our, our small capacity. But we, we had so many people in the community looking out for us um, that, you know, never felt like we were going to just fail because we had, we had so many people all like, had our backs. <laughs> That is that is wonderful. That is 
certainly a Cinderella story. If, if there <laughs> so, um, wonderful. Well, we do have some more questions coming in, but uh, we are about to hit the end of our uh, our time here. So we'll have to end it there. But um, both Dominic and Megan have uh, graciously offered to um, to go ahead and reply to the remaining questions. So we'll make sure that uh, they get those questions and, and we'll go ahead and reply post the responses within the Community Orchard Network Google group um, over the next um, couple weeks or so. Um, so thank you both to Dominic and to Megan for a wonderful presentation. Um, thanks to everyone for attending this AC Trees webcast. We appreciate you hanging in there with us um, at, in the early part of the, the session. And um, please continue this conversation in the Google group forum. Uh, if you're not already um, a member, you can go ahead and email orchard at actrees.org to uh, join the uh, Community Orchard Network Google group. Um, all webcast attendees will be automatically added to the Google group. So if you're listening to this as a recording, um, you can just email orchard at actrees.org. Uh, the Community Orchard Network webcasts are held on the fourth Tuesday of each month. And if you're interested in being a presenter, send us a note um, also to that same address, orchard at actrees.org. And stay tuned for the announcement of our next webcast next month. And uh, we're going to go, or excuse me, in the fall, we're going to actually take a little hiatus in, in August, but we will gear right back up for planting and harvesting season in September. So have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.